Yeah. Like, yeah, we <laughs> there we go. Okay. Oh my god. <laughs> That's pretty good. Is, is it backwards? Is there a way to flip it? I, it might not look backwards to someone looking at it. It might just be because we're looking at ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Do you want me to check on film? Sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, because you do it on your phone. Do I just click the link? Yes. Okay. You should be able to just click the link. <laughs> do you want a little more? <laughs> Nice. Well, they can't see the slides. Is it possible to put it like here? Do you think? Well, uh, we don't want to give any away. You think you can't see it? Just because you think it's going to be too small? Oh, here we go. I can see it. Is it is text forward? <laughs> yes. Okay, that's fine. it. Okay, yeah. What if cool. we put it here? This is so cool. Sure. Yeah, Great. Okay. Okay, good. Do you want me to? I can sit. It's, it's like Do you want me to? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think they do that on purpose. Yeah, this is good. This is fine. Great. Do you want me to? I'll, I can sit. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> is there a yeah. plug here? I'm at 100%. You think it'll last an hour? Yeah. Or two hours? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we can see her there before in your own. I mean, I'll chat with her. And I'll save her. Did you get on No, he was talking about it. He was like, I do. Nah, it's not quite good enough. <laughs> Yes, my dog is the Yeah, I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried Don't worry. USB connection. Just in case. Oh, 
okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aaron did it too. I expected there was going to be problems. Like, All right. <laughs> I like to hear. Nice. There you go. No, no, no. Oh. I mean, I was like, but how could I? I don't expect you to have a show in there. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I know what you're wearing. That. Oh, I wasn't. No? No. Okay. No, I didn't hear about it. I think it's called an olive. I have a cough that is never going to go away. I just text me and you can hear my voice. Oh. I know. Don't say anything. Hey, Zach. <laughs> I don't know if it was like right here. Okay, I know, yeah. I know. Where is that? I don't know. Where is that? And Dana. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's sitting in his office. Okay. What a loser. <laughs> Ooh! Someone make it? Yeah. Right. Oh, wow! Yeah. Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. It's one of my, like, go-tos in the grocery store. I'll just make it, like, so many times. Whoa! Yeah. Oh, my God, I'm so excited. Thank you. 
think people understand. Yeah, I think people just kind of have, you know, people are too bad at that. You know what I mean? It's usually, it's usually like, people are not thinking about that. <laughs> They're like, I was like, no, yeah, that. People are like, oh, you're there, you can be in London. They'd be like, oh, I'm nice here with this. I know. Oh, here with a short introduction um, to Tom's uh, geologic history. He got a bachelor's degree in uh, geology from Harvard University in 2009, and then he followed that by a year at MIT working with geophysicists on the geothermal potential of uh, high uranium rocks in New Hampshire and also hot springs related systems in Utah. He then won a Fulbright scholarship that took him to Iceland to work on geothermal systems there, where he's won a, a student research award in Europe shortly afterwards. He started in the PhD program at Stanford in 2011, and he impressed me with his energy and initiative right away. Within months of arriving at Stanford, he essentially single-handedly put together a proposal on a topic which I knew almost nothing about, to, that allowed him to uh, secure a prestigious three-year uh, U.S. Department of Defense fellowship that funded his work. And despite having very little formal field work training from Harvard, um, our first field season demonstrated to me um, what an innate talent he had um, in the field. He was quickly able to relate something he'd seen over here with another outcrop there and immediately got the implications of what uh, that meant, demonstrating the sort of four-dimensional reasoning that is the hallmark of an excellent real geologist. Also, his physical prowess in going up and down <laughs> uh, steep slopes was astonishing. And only if he was laden with 80 pounds of rock samples and a foot sore corgi did I have any chance of even staying with him. Along the way to finishing his PhD, um, Tom completed a master's thesis mapping and doing the geochronology that established uh, a caldera in East, the Mid-Miocene caldera in eastern uh, Oregon that is related to the eruption of the Columbia River basalts. He then moved on to study the better exposed and less altered rocks of the McDermott <coughs> caldera in northern um, Nevada. And his PhD has been a tour de force combining field mapping, high precision argon dating, igneous geochemistry, and microbeam analyses using the shrimp that's produced important results as diverse as establishing the detailed history of a large caldera system, um, the geolo geology of a large chunk of real estate across uh, northern Nevada and southeastern Oregon, eruption rates of clim climate uh, and changing flood basalts, and illuminating what controls the distribution of lithium resources in this and other related caldera systems worldwide. Along the way, he's received numerous awards and grants for his research, including an AGU Outstanding Student Presentation Award, an uh, GSA Mineralogy and Petrology Division Student Research Award, and he obtained funding for Penrose Grant and USGS EDMAP grants, and finally finished up by uh, earning a Stanford USGS Geologic uh, Survey Fellowship. He's been a stalwart of our teaching pool here at Stanford and um, GS, including teaching six different classes, um, which culminate, culminated in him receiving the University Centennial Teaching Award, and Harvard inviting him to lead a field trip uh, to the Big Island of Hawaii. He also served as a mentor to two of our Stanford undergraduates, a high school student who went on to 
geology degree at UW, and a Harvard undergraduate who gave him the ultimate compliment of following in his uh, footsteps by going on for a PhD in volcanology. Tom is considered a leader among our graduate students. Um, he's a ringleader of many of our Christmas parties. He's frequently asked to serve on departmental and school committees. Um, he's pursued his interest in mineral deposits by founding a student chapter of the Society of Economic Geologists. He's also been the student liaison to the Mineralogy and Petrology Division at the Geologic Survey, excuse me, Ge Geologic Society of America. And he was selected as a uh, inaugural member of the Student Affairs Committee of the GSA. But let me just finish up by um, saying how much I have enjoyed working with Tom. Tom's the kind of colleague um, that always leaves you feeling more energized about doing research um, after you've met with him. And there's no higher compliment you can give to somebody. It's been my honor to watch him grow into the imaginative, multifaceted, and articulate scientist that you'll see on this board. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for being here. It's so wonderful to see so many smiling faces that came from a building away, even half the country away, the whole country away, even from Japan earlier this week. So I'm so honored to have you all here, to, and I'm excited to talk to you about what I've been up to the past six years. So as Gail alluded to, I'll be discussing the geology of the McDermott Volcanic Field and its implications for flood basalt eruptive processes and resources of lithium. This is a rough outline of the talk. I'll first give a general introduction about volcanology and then why we want to study the McDermott volcanic field. And then I'll go into the main bulk of my work, which was the mapping, geochronology, and geochemistry of McDermott. And then I'll go into the different implications of this work for the age of the Steens basalt, which is a flood basalt, the progression of flood basalt, volcanism within flood basalt provinces, and finally go into different uh, the implications of this work for lithium resources. All of this work has either been published or is about to be published. Uh, chapter one in the GSA bulletin is in press, should be out any week now. They've been saying that for a month or so. But, um, second chapter is published this year in Earth and Planetary Science Centers, and the final chapter is in its second round of revisions at Nature Communications. So first, a uh, general introduction to volcanology. When most of us think of volcanoes, we think of places like Hawaii, where you have these very slow moving lava flows that sometimes you can outrun, you can outwalk, and some people even like to drop things in them to see what happens, like spam, ravioli, or in this case, a monster energy drink to see what happens. And as you can see, it's kind of exciting, it explodes. <laughs> So other times people think of places like Mount Fuji in Japan where you have this classic stratocone uh, dominating the skyline. Uh, similarly, the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, another one of these stratocones that's famous in the U.S. Also the eruption of Vesuvius that led to the destruction of the city of Pompeii. And this has caused Hollywood to many times depict these volcanoes as perhaps dooming humanity. In volcano, a super uh, a volcano erupts in the center of LA. Pierce Brosnan saves us all on Dante's Peak. And recently, the movie Pompeii erupts. There's no warning, no escape, but there's time to kiss. <laughs> so, do, is humanity doomed from volcanoes? Well, if we look at volumes of these eruptions, the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 results in the eruption of about a quarter cubic kilometer of material. And this little dot here shows what that means. Relative to, say, the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD, which is another order of magnitude greater. You can see the dot gets a little bigger. And this volume is roughly equivalent to the total amount of material that's been erupting at Kilauea on the Big Island of Hawaii since 1983. Now, if we compare that to the eruption of the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff from Yellowstone Volcanic Field, this is all three members of the Tuff at about 2.1 million years ago. We have about 2,500 cubic kilometers of material. So supervolcanoes are an order of magnitude uh, greater than that. And Yellowstone actually makes it into the news a lot. 
And see, these are some headlines over the past year about Yellowstone. Super volcano underneath Yellowstone National Park can wipe out half of the U.S. if it erupts. Or chill, Yellowstone's volcano isn't about to destroy us all. Or more dubious ones, more UFOs over Yellowstone <laughs> signal that super volcano is set to erupt. So I would classify that as what we like to call fake <laughs> So what is the hazard that we see from super volcanoes? This is a map of the western U.S. Yellowstone National Park is shown right there. And each of these fields show different clouds of the, alpha, of the ash fall from the main eruptions over the past three, three, two million years. The Huckleberry Ridge Tuff in green that we saw before, the Lava Creek Tuff, and the Mesa Falls Tuff. <clears throat> However, as you get closer to the vent, you have an additional hazard associated with these eruptions called the ignimbrites, which you'll hear me talk about a lot today. So ignimbrites and all the material are sourced from what are called calderas. And this is a generalized geological map of Yellowstone National Park and vicinity, showing the three main calderas for the major three eruptions, and the different colors correspond to the extent of the outflow sheet of the ignimbrites. And you can see that in this case, these pyroclastic clouds that move at supersonic speeds only make it distances up to 60, 70 kilometers from the vent max. Fortunately, none of these have erupted in human time scales. Well, fortunately for most people, unfortunately for volcanologists, we'd love to see that. So in order to understand the hazards and the frequency of these eruptions, we really need to study ancient systems because we want to get a sense of how frequently these systems erupt, what causes to them erupt, and also to understand their effects on the climate. And so to do this, we have to look at called old calderas. And I like to think of calderas as sort of like a puzzle. Several pieces of the puzzle all come together to help us understand uh, and answer some of these questions that we want to answer. We have the composition of the crust that's around the magma chamber. We have caldera collapse faults that, that can help localize where these calderas form. We have the ignimbrite, or sometimes called tough, I'll use these terms interchangeably today, that uh, one extends for several kilometers from the vent, but also a big thickness of it can pond within the caldera as well. And this tuff is made up of an ashy matrix, pumice lapilli that as it erupts are quenched and remains in the tuff. The phenocryst or crystals of different minerals that uh, crystallize during uh, cooling of the magma chamber. And finally, pieces of wall rock called lithics that are ripped off the side of the vent as it erupts. And there are several pieces of one of the tufts that are circulating around here. You'll see it has, it's very densely welded, it has little crystals, you can see all of these constituents in them. Um, finally, uh, or two more things, you have Caldera Lake that can form within the depression in the ground formed during the collapse of the caldera. There's a famous Caldera Lake up at Crater Lake National Park in Southern Oregon. We can also have post-caldera volcanism, that if there's residual magma in the magma chamber following the eruption, it can take advantage of these caldera collapse faults. They can act as sort of like a zone of least resistance for the magma to rise and erupt on the surface. And finally, we can have hydrothermal activity along the caldera ring fractures. They like to take advantage of those faults again, and those can cause thermal systems as well as oftentimes mineralization of resources like gold, silver, molybdenum, etc. So all of these pieces of the puzzle, including all the different parts of the ignimbrite, can come together and help us answer some important questions we have about these systems. How frequently these guys will erupt? What is the hazard of, of active silicic centers? What is the impact of these have on climate? And also we can develop genetic models for the formation of different mineral resources. So why do we want to look at the McDermott Volcanic Field in particular? This is a map of the western U.S. showing, once again, Yellowstone National Park. These number here, numbers here correspond to the age of the different volcanic fields. You can see there's a nice progression with time out to McDermott Volcanic Field at about 16 million years. And this rate and progression is roughly equivalent to the motion of the North American plate. It's opposite and equal to this progression, and it's called a hot spot. There's a famous hot spot that everyone knows about is Hawaii. You can see on the big island of Hawaii is where the active volcanism is. And if you can think of it as like a Bunsen burner, holding the Bunsen burner still and bring a plate over or your stove for the non-scientists in the audience. And as you drag that paper, in this case the plate, over the active flame, 
you leave a trail of old extinct burnt paper, or in this case, volcanoes in its path. And so in this case, there's a, the hotspot used to be under McDermott, but as the North American plate migrated, the stable hotspot and the uh, moving North American plate caused this hotspot track. What's interesting about these hotspot track is many of these hotspots at their initiation have large flood basalt provinces. These are orders of magnitude, several orders of magnitude greater than that largest eruption we saw of the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff. And these are oftentimes linked, uh, many people think, to uh, extinctions. So this is a plot here, sorry it's hard to read, age of extinction on the y-axis and the age of the continental flood basalt on the x-axis you can see many of these events in these dots here show a nice correlation. So many people think that there's a, co a correlation and causation. So we can use flood basalts uh, to help understand potentially the effect on mass extinctions to see if these are causing these mass extinctions or if there's some other more dubious uh, theories out there that can explain it. So if we zoom into Yellowstone on the map here is a uh, on the left here is a map of the North American plates. We have the Juan de Fuca plate subducting underneath for the Pacific Northwest, leading to the Cascade volcanisms shown by those triangles. The Pacific plate here is here, and it's riding north against the North American plate. And the Y here refers to Yellowstone. And if we zoom into this map on the right, we can see that we have, in these colors here, this is the outcrop extent of the Columbia River flood basalt province. So this is the flood basalt province associated with initiation of the Yellowstone hotspot. And there are three main volcanic fields that we'll get to in a minute associated with this flood basalt. If we look at maps of the flood basalt province uh, on the right and on the left, we have relative age of the flood basalt. And on the x-axis, x axis, we have the volumes of the flood basalt. The first member, the steam basalt, erupted in northern Nevada and southern Oregon um, and resulted in an eruption of about 35,000 cubic kilometers of material. This was followed to the north by the Imnaha basalt along the Oregon-Idaho-Washington borders from flood basalt dikes that then flowed to the west. But all of these pale in comparison to the main event, which has more volume than all the others combined of the Columbia River basalt group, the Grand Ronde basalt, erupted from vents along the same area and then flowed, these flows flowed all the way out to the coast. And for comparison purposes, that's 150,000 cubic kilometers. That one eruption of the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff was 2,500 cubic kilometers. So we're dealing with a significantly greater volume of material. Finally, up until about 15 million years ago, the last main member of the Columbia basalt group was the Wanapum basalt, rounding out the main stage. Contemporaneous with all of this volcanism were three main silicic centers associated with flood basalt provinces. The McDermott volcanic field, which is this, oops, sorry, which is the subject of this study. The High Rock Caldera complex, which was studied by Yale's former student Matt, and who's on my committee. And finally, the Lake Hawaii volcanic field, which I studied for my master's project. Now, so we want to use the silicic volcanism to help understand the history of Yellowstone and the flood basalt province, but we also are interested in McDermott because it has a high proportion of ore resources. On the left here is a map showing the new calderas that we've identified in northern McDermott. The circles correspond to the caldera uh, ring fractures. And in red here is lithium, a lithium deposit that's hosted within the caldera lake sediments of the McDermott caldera. This is the largest lithium deposit in the United States. Dots here you can see different other resources including mercury, uranium, and gallium. And in fact, this area used to be the largest mercury mine in the United States for much of the 20th century. So it's important to understand the geology of McDermott and get it right to help us understand why these resources occur where they do. So now I want to get into the main bulk of my work, which is the fundamental geology of the McDermott volcanic field. This is the updated map showing in dark circles the new calderas that we've refined and thin dashed lines, we see these older calderas that were previously believed, but with all the new technology and dating techniques, we're able to refine the stratigraphy to consisting of four main caldera forming eruptions and four aching and four uh, calderas. 
This is a map on the right showing the calderas of McDermott Volcanic Field in dark black. stuff going up in age is on the top right. Now also on this map are these colored lines which shows the different outflow extent, the extent of the different outflow sheets for each ignoblet and they're color coded to their name. And you can see each of these dots here of different colors, these are all locations where I've sampled the different ignoblets and did whole rock geochemistry to help correlate the ignoblets to each other. This uh, whole rock geochemistry, you can see a plot of zirconium versus rubidium on the left here, on each of these ignobrites to help define distinct differentiation terms. So you can see in green and orange, which are the Trout Creek and Oregon Canyon Tufts, they follow basically the same trend, which is consistent with the fact that their calderas overlap for each other. They use the same magnet chamber. The, the Long Ridge Tuff and the Tuff of White Horse Creek also have distinct differentiation trends. So we can use this as a tool to help Because this is located in the basin range, there are several instances where a lot of these the stratigraphy is exposed, so we can actually see these stacks on top of each other, because otherwise they're just walking on the surface of the youngest one on the on the when you walk across the desert. So the colors here correspond to the different ignobrites, and the yellow correspond to other rhyolites throughout the field, and the gray here field are flows of the steams basalt. In addition to using chemistry to correlate the different units, we can also ask questions about the geochemistry of the magma chamber from which it came. This is a blow up of this section in Trout Creek where we did a detailed chemical transect up the Tough. So this is the Tough of Oregon Canyon. You can see the magma chamber was initially reversely zoned, followed by a normal zonation. And then you see the, in the overlying Trout Creek Tough, it is completely normally zoned. In addition to geochemistry, to help constrain the stratigraphy, we also did very detailed 4039 geochronology here in the Thermochronology Lab at Stanford. Uh, this is a plot here of a representative sample of the Tough of Trout Creek, sampled from uh, this section right here. You can see that we're using inverse isochron ages to develop these, to obtain these high precision ages. The double plus minus here corresponds to the fact that these errors are reported at two sigma. And so we're, we did this on several different samples of the ignimbrites. Um, each, this is a panel showing age from younger to older on the X axis, and each dot here corresponds to an individual sample. Uh, collected from throughout the field, and each sample has about 22 feldspar grains that were analyzed to get these precisions. And the vertical bars correspond to the weighted mean error of the inverse isochron ages. So we're getting very precise errors uh, down to uh, under 10,000 years at 16 and a half million years. And it's important to note that these are precise ages, but they're not necessarily accurate because they have a uh, other external factors, including the age of a flux monitor that we use and a radiation constant set. If you want to compare to other people's ages or other studies, you need to account additional error into this. Uh, but relative to each other, we're very confident in the relative age and precision of these samples. Now, we use this ignimbrite stratigraphy and detailed ages of the different ignimbrites to help develop a map of the northern McDermott volcanic field. In addition to the ignimbrites, we also analyze rhyolite lavas and other types of lavas that are outcrop throughout the field. In total, uh, I did 330 whole rock geochemical analyses and 60, uh, 4039 ages on the ignimbrites and lavas from throughout this region. And on this map, the dots correspond to places where I just took samples for geochemistry, and the stars correspond to places where I've gotten high precision geochronology as well. So on the lavas, where this is the same plot before of zirconium versus rubidium, where in the circles we have the different compositions and trends of the ignimbrites, and I've also included on here in squares, color coded to the ignimbrites, the different lavas from the northern McDermott volcanic field. So the green squares here are lavas associated with the Trout Creek caldera. The orange squares are associated with the Oregon Canyon. 
uh, Caldera. And you can see for the these white horse ones, they fall off the trend, but that's because these, these are post-caldera lavas that have, uh, the magma has stabilized zircon, so you can start to see a drop off in the amount of zirconium. So we can use this as another tool to help us correlate different lavas to different caldera systems. So this on the top is the same plot before of ignimbrites that I showed, but I've extended the vertical bars down into this lower panel, which shows the new ages on the lavas from the northern part of the field. You can see in some instances the precisions, these are two sigma errors, are greater than the, uh, we can distinguish them from the caldera form eruption. So when relationships are unclear in the field, if it's a pre or post caldera lava, we can actually help use the ages as a tool to reconstruct the history and add more pieces to that caldera puzzle to come up with the final uh, answer to our questions. So now I'm gonna go through the brief, briefly go through the geologic history of this region. This is a combination of all these pieces of the puzzle, including previous mapping done by Jim Raituba at the USGS, who's on my committee here today, as well as all my field work that I've done, the geochemistry, geochronology, and some geophysical constraints as well. So first in red here, we have eruption of the Steens Basalt. That was that earliest member of the Columbia River Flood Basalt province that we talked about. And it forms a topographic high here in the Trout Creek Mountains. This was followed at about uh, 16.5 million years ago by eruption of lavas that are chemically similar in composition to the Oregon Canyon Tuff that we saw before. This is a picture showing one of these lavas. There's me standing on a rock for scale. So you can see these beautiful flo vertical flow foliations in this rhyolite lava taken from right here in that orange center, uh, showing that we're very close to the vent for this lava. At 16.47, the Tuff of Oregon Canyon erupted from this newly identified caldera, the fit, which I'm calling the Fish Creek Caldera. The Ignimbrite flowed dominantly to the north, but you can see some outcrops of it atop some pre-caldera lavas there, as well as down here. So we can use the relation, stratigraphic relationship there to help us discern that the, that lava there was actually pre-caldera to the caldera form eruption. We can also use another piece of evidence. This is a picture of a welded fall deposit taken right here where you have rapid variations in welding uh, at over very short intervals and large lipids, indicating that this tuff must be near vent. So we're confident that we're very close to the caldera. Previously, this ignorite was thought to come from about 20 kilometers away. So we can use all these lines of evidence to help start piece, to get, piece together our puzzle. After eruption of the Tuff of Oregon Canyon, <coughs> Uh, lava erupted within the moat of the caldera, and then all within 50,000 years, a large volume of trachytic lava came out from a vent about seven kilometers southeast of the map border. This was followed uh, by the eruption of the Tuff of Trout Creek at about 16.42 million years ago from this newly identified caldera, which I'm calling the Pole Canyon Caldera. Now this tuff is the largest most voluminous tuff from this northern part of the field, and it flowed dominantly to the north and west, but we can see it flo also flowed to the east, but as you can see, it kind of stops here. That's because this was a topographic high by the earlier caldera, so when the tuff came, it banked in against that wall of the older caldera, and this is a picture take I took from the southern margin, of, southern edge of the White Horse Canyon here, where you can see this is that orange pre-caldera lava sitting there. This is an old caldera ring fracture, and the tuff of Trout Creek came from this vent here and ponded very thickly against this caldera margin, and then flowed, jumped over and flowed and was thinner as it flowed to the east. And you can see the tuff of Long Ridge kind of creeps out very thin at the top there, and that was the next main event at 16.33 million years ago. It came from the main McDermott caldera to the south, flow to the north, it gets very thin as you get up here, although it does pond somewhat thickly against the margins of the caldera there. After a very significant time gap in this sort of time frame, about 60,000 years later, a few lavas erupted within the moat of the Pole Canyon caldera. Then, oops, we're missing the guy, maybe it'll come up here. Oh, then the White Horse Tuff erupted and uh, from this White Horse Caldera, which was previously identified before we refined the margins of it, 
And here it banked in against this second oldest called error margin. And as you can see in this photo here, it does a loyal field assistant Maxine for scale. You can see the non welded to densely welded portion of this tuff. It's about 20 meters thick. But as you get closer to the edge of the caldera, it gets over 100 meters thick. So it ponds thickly against these old caldera margins, which are further lines of evidence that we use for that. At about following eruption of the wet horse tuff, we had eruption of these along post caldera lavas along the ring fracture. Like I mentioned before, these were remaining lavas that took advantage of the ring fractures of this caldera, as well as the ring fracture faults of the older calderas as well, and erupted there. And now finally, I'll throw on caldera lake sediments here, because there are caldera lake sediments associated with all three calderas. However, the only ones that are well exposed are these youngest two. The sediments outcrop locally here, but they're mostly covered by the younger stricter. So that was the bulk of my field work, geochemistry, geochronology. But now I want to go into the implications of this work for a few things. First being the age of the steam basalt. On the left here, you see another loyal field assistant, Emily Williams, sitting on the tuff of Oregon Canyon. And then that's followed stratigraphically above by flows of steam basalt, that tracheidic lava I talked about, and then the other remaining ignimbrites from McDermott. We actually use the high precision ages that we obtain on these rhyolite rhyolite ignimbrites, and knowing the thickness of the basalt, we can actually estimate an accumulation rate or eruptive rate for the steam basalt. And we want to use the rhyolites because the basalts are inherently difficult to date due to the fact that they have low potassium in their feldspars, and therefore will have low argon. So we won't get high precision ages like we do on the rhyolites. We can also do this over in the Pueblo Mountains. This is the dark flows here are flows of steam basalt, and these light layers you see in there are tufts that are interbedded with different flows of steam basalt. These are blowups of these tufts on the left. You can see steam basalt here, steam basalt here, and this is an airfall tuff. You can see the top of it was baked by the overlying lava flow, like that one at Kilauea that slowly rode over it. So we can use the high precision ages here and these tufts to help constrain the eruptive rate of steam basalt. In the center here is a map showing the McDermott calderas. And each of these squares corresponds to locations where we've obtained, where we use tufts to help constrain the age of the salts. And the two yellow dots are blown out on the side. This is that Pueblo Mountain slide I showed on the left. The gray corresponds to Steen's basalt, and the colors correspond to the different ignimbrites. And you can see on the right, we have where Emily was sitting on the Oregon Canyon tuft. We can also use the thickness of those flows to help constrain the rates. In parentheses here, are the errors on the last digit at two sigma. So you can see that within a stratigraphic section, the ages are getting younger with time, which is good. It means our dating technique works and we can actually use this to constrain eruptive rates. But a quick note on the errors, you'll see that there's a variable degree of errors in these, and that's largely a function of the feldspar composition. So on the ones from McDermott, which have, which have very uh, high precisions, we have calcium to potassium ratios that are very low, so they're very rich in potassium. However, on some of the ages where we get relatively less precise errors, you can see that the calcium potassium, calcium outpaces the potassium by a lot in these plagioclase feldspars, so that's the cause for a bunch of these errors. So we can use all of this, all of these sections from around the area to make this composite stratigraphic column. In gray here are the steams basalt and the intercalated tufts with the two sigma errors. And you can see that this is youngest to oldest, so they're getting younger with time as you go up section. And we can use these other rhyolites, in addition to these tufts, to help constrain the eruptive rate. And we estimate an accumulation rate for the steam basalt of about 2.4 meters per thousand years, which doesn't seem like a lot, but in geologic time, it is very fast. Um, and we can also use it to help constrain the total amount of eruptive time uh, of the steams basalt, which in this era was occurred from about 16.64 to 16.43 million years ago. Now you may say, why do we care about the nitpicking of ages? Well, if we look at this plot, this is age going from youngest to oldest. The carbon and isotopic, carbon and oxygen isotopic record recorded in sediment cores. Um, these have been used to indicate this Miocene climactic optimum, so a global warming event that started in this gray interval and continued onward. 
Our new, and it, they have it starting at around 16.82 million years ago. Our new high precision ages shows that the uh, flood basalt event, which starts with the steams, this is our age range here, and continues through to the younger members of the flood basalt province, actually postdates the onset of this climatic optimum, indicating that this may not have been the forcing mechanism for this global warming event. So it did not cause, uh, likely, a large uh, decrease in biodiversity. So now I want to get into the implications of this work for the progression of flood basalt volcanism. But this is the map we saw before with the different flows of flood basalts. And the steamed basalt was sourced from these feeder dikes that are called the steam swarm. The picture of basalt, basalt shown in tan was sourced from the monument dike swarm. And the Chief Joseph swarm, which is the largest swarm, was sourced from Indaha and Grand Ronde basalt. So, like we said before, basalts are difficult to date, so we can actually use this contemporaneous silicic volcanism to help understand how these flood basalts progressed with time and use the new mapping to understand how they progressed in space as well. So this is a map on the right that with the state borders, pounds basically restored to about 16 million years ago. Uh, so you can see they're kind of skewed. And the red lines here are schematic locations of Steen's basalt dikes. The stars correspond to different vents for lavas in the region. You can see that the new mapping of cold air is at McDermott align with the orientation of dikes in this location. They also align with volcanism in the Santa Rosa Calico Center to the southeast, as well as the northern Nevada Rift, which contains an aeromagnetic anomaly and younger volcanism relative to the McDermott area. If we throw in the ages here, we can see that starting with the Oregon Canyon Tuff and Trap Creek Tuff, down through to the Cold Springs Tuff from the Santa Rosa Center, you can see a nice southward progression with time from 16.5 to 15.7 million years ago. And this corresponds to a caldera collapse rate southward of about 12 centimeters per year. If we compare this to the High Rock Caldera Complex, you can see that calderas of the High Rock Center align with the orientation of dikes in the Steens and Pueblo Mountains, also aligns with volcanism within the Hawks Valley Low Mountain Center, and the Buffalo Hills, and if we look at the ages here, we see a remarkable similarity. We have eruption of the Monument Basin Tuff at 16.5, followed progressively to south at 15.7 million years ago. So, so it's at the same time interval, and this corresponds to a very similar rate of about 14 centimeters per year. So this leads us to conclude that these violated calderas are marking the southward propagation of silicic volcanism that's fueled by the intrusion of two distinct dike swarms. It was previously thought to be just one dike swarm, but we can now, with these high precision ages and mapping, delineate two distinct swarms. This is another way of looking at it. On the y-axis, we have radial distance from Steens Mountain, so Steens will be up there at zero, and we have age on the opposite way now, so oldest to youngest. And each of these circles corresponds to a different rhyolitic eruption, and they're scaled to their volume. So the largest circles correspond to the caldera forming ignimbrites, these super eruptions, and these smaller circles are the rhyolite lavas. So you can see that they form this nice trend of 15 centimeters per year or less, both in the green McDermott swarms, as well as the blue high rock swarms. I want to note that this circle up here, that's the tuff of Whitehorse Creek. And I think it's a completely different uh, system associated with a much younger basaltic intrusive event, and that's consistent with what we see here. It's not related to this main progression of flood basalt volcanism. And it's also consistent, it has slightly different chemistry. So what does this mean? It means that this now we bring the total number of dike swarms to about four that form a nice X centered at Steens Mountain. And so we see that all of these dike swarms converge there, and we just saw that the volcanism migrated southward in these two swarms, and there's paleomagnetic evidence that shows that basaltic volcanism youngs to the north in the Chief Justice Swarm. So this is all consistent with a plume-related type 2 giant dike swarm, where you have a fanning pattern of, sub, of swarms that, is, that occur in distinct subswarms and that radiate out from a central point. So this is all consistent with the plume theory of Yellowstone, of the Yellowstone hotspot, where you had a plume head first impinge on the lithosphere and it resulted in the crustal melting along four distinct dike swarms. And then, you had, as the North American plate migrated southeast with time, as we discussed, that plume head was sheared off, and the relatively stable plume tail remained stationary as the 
North American Plate Road Southwest, and you were left with this relatively narrow path of the Snake River Plain out to Yellowstone. So finally, I want to go into the implications of this work for lithium resources. This is a tad of a jump, but it's important. Because, as we saw earlier, McDermott hosts the largest lithium deposit in the United States. But why do we care about lithium? If we look at lithium resources throughout the, the country, we can see that the McDermott deposit is on par. These are once again scaled to their size, uh, with some of the largest deposits in the world. The blues are brines, which are the largest in the world. The Solar de Onai in Bolivia has, is about 10 megaton resource. Uh, the pegmatite deposits are the most numerous, but not the least voluminous, if that makes sense, uh, because pegmatites occur everywhere, but they are very rich in lithium. And finally, clay deposits, like the one in McDermott, one in Mexico, and one in Serbia form, or lithium is rich clays uh, deposit within basins. So we care about lithium because it's classified as an energy critical element. On the y-axis, we see importance to clean energy. On the x-axis, we see risk to supply. So this is things like geopolitical circumstances like war, trade, etc. You can see rare earths are the most uh, demanding there, but lithium is right up there with that resource. And we use lithium, and everyone in this room, I'm pretty sure, uses it because they have one of these. Each of your phones have a lithium ion battery in them. Hopefully not one of the ones that flake too spontaneously from bus. But they're also used in hybrid and electric vehicles to give them the long-lasting batteries. And Tesla just opened their Gigafactory in Reno, Nevada. These are headlines from just the past few months. And this Gigafactory is an hour and a half from the largest lithium resource in the country, yet they import all of the lithium from Mexico. So it doesn't make much sense from that standpoint. If we look at this in another way, we can see geologic resource size of lithium on the x-axis and the different countries that have geologic resources of lithium. And the color, once again, corresponds to clay, pegmatite, and brine deposits. And you can see the US is right here. We have a pretty diverse set of resources, but this green here is uh, basically all McDermott complex. So it's great that we have a lot of resources. However, if you look on the y-axis, this is 2015 production of lithium. And you can see the market is totally dominated by Australia and Chile. So all of these countries rely on Australia and Chile, in addition to the 100 or so other countries that don't have any lithium resources. So it is a strategic resource from that standpoint. In addition, this is another way of looking at it. This is a bar graph showing the total lithium resource. You can see color-coded the type. We have known geologic resources of about 45 megatons of lithium. What's currently economically extractable is only about 13 or so megatons. And this bar here shows the estimated range for lithium consumption through 2050. Mm -hmm. And the, the large range is due to uncertainties in the market for hybrid and electric vehicles. But you can see we have the potential of eating up a lot of our resource. So I set out to understand why this resource exists and to help potentially, since we have these new calderas mapped in the northern part of the field with caldera lake sediments, could there be an additional resource there? Unfortunately, you can't just go up and collect a rock on the surface of the earth and analyze it like I did for the earlier part of the study, because lithium is a very volatile element, meaning that if it's sitting in a magma, as soon as it erupts and sees vapor, it's going to escape to the atmosphere, so whatever you measure on the surface of the earth will not be representative of the lithium content of the magma. In addition, these rocks sit on the surface of the Earth, in this case, for 16 million years, and they're subject to intense weathering and alteration, especially in the caldera setting, where you have a lot of hot fluid circulating, which can leach the lithium out of the rock. So to get around this, petrologists like to use a technique called melt inclusion measurement. Melt inclusions are little blebs of magma that are trapped. Um, as a crystal is growing in a magma chamber, it traps that little piece of magma, and then that crystal acts as sort of like a pressure vessel, so when the ignimbrite erupts and uh, is on the surface of the earth, that melt inclusion still records the pre-erupted magnetic concentration. I specifically use quartz host in melt inclusions uh, for multiple reasons. One is because quartz is nearly ubiquitous in all the rhyolites that I study. Two, because quartz doesn't have any cleavage, so it's harder for the melt inclusions to leak. And finally, because by analyzing only quartz host in melt inclusions, from all the different rocks. In a sense, we're fixing the silica activity of the magma, so we're always analyzing lithium content at the exact moment 
or lithium or of course it's crystallizing. But unfortunately, you can't just zap the melt inclusion with a laser because lithium is a pain in the butt. <laughs> and it's because of its volatility. So this is an SEM image of a melt inclusion that has a vapor bubble and crystals in it. So if it pulls slowly enough, uh, you will form these different phases into which lithium can differentially partition. So the lithium content here is not necessarily the same as the lithium content there within the melt inclusion. So to get around this, I used the furnaces first here in Jonathan's lab at Stanford, but then I went over to the USGS and Tom Sisson's lab where I put quartz grains in a little capsule, dropped them in a pressure vessel, and, uh, and I put the pressurized it at one and a half kilobars, and there was a cooled water head of this like long pressure vessel. Then I drop it into a furnace at a thousand degrees Celsius to simulate magmatic conditions. And then I kept it there for an hour and then pulled the pressure vessel out of the furnace and flipped it upside down so the capsule fell into the water cooled head of the furnace and it immediately quenched the melt inclusions to a homogeneous glass. So these are melt inclusions from the same sample, the soldier meadow is tough. And so the lithium content is homogeneous throughout the inclusion. On the right here is a plot showing concentration of different elements. Each dot corresponds to a different element. On the y-axis is the non-homogenized concentration of element X. On the x-axis is the homogenized concentration of element X. But as you can see, for most elements, it follows roughly a one-to-one -one line, meaning that the homogenization isn't necessary for those elements. However, for these little guys, little volatile guys, lithium and copper, you can see they're much higher in the homogenized inclusions because of this, the lack of that vapor bubble there in these. So it's really necessary to homogenize these inclusions to get at lithium content. So we finally are able to analyze the lithium after doing all that. So we have to polish each individual grain down to the inclusion is exposed. And then we analyze it on the shrimp RG here at Stanford. And I did two different sessions on the shrimp, one in 2014 and one in 2015. This is a plot showing intensity in the detector versus concentration of lithium for natural glass standards. And you can see that these follow nice one-to-one -one lines. And so we, whatever, when we put our unknowns in the machine, and we measure a certain intensity, we can use that to get at the concentration of the unknown. And in addition to lithium, I also analyzed 42 other trace <coughs> elements. Now this is a seal image of one of these quartz grains with uh, two melt inclusions, and these are spot sizes, rough spot sizes on these inclusions. And these are the results. On the y-axis, we see lithium concentration in parts per million. On the x-axis, another incompatible element, rubidium in uh, parts per million, and these dots are different individual inclusions corresponding to quartz phenocris from the different tufts. You can see that all the magnets at McDermott contain roughly similar lithium concentrations of average of 1400 ppm. This is interesting because it's much higher than average rhyolite class measured throughout the world of about 100 or so. And we do know that that is measured on degassed rhyolite glass, but still this enrichment is significant. And the range that we see is consistent with normal values for fractional crystallization. To understand how this compared to other systems, I analyzed several other rhyolites from throughout the world. The Hideaway Park Tuff from Colorado, which erupted, it was a partial melt of uh, a very thick continental lithosphere, has the highest lithium contest ever measured in mountain inclusions. So a very high lithium-rich number there. Look at in yellow here are that is that Huckleberry Ridge tuff that we talked about in the beginning of the talk. You see it's very similar composition lithium than to the Magnus at McDermott. At the nearby High Rock Caldera complex, the Soldier Meadows tuff has the same rubidium, zirconium, and other of the main trace element compositions of McDermott, yet it has a huge drop off in lithium concentration. And this is likely a function of the type of crust that it erupts through. So McDermott erupts on transitional crust between the continent and accreted terrains that bashed into the side of North America over century, over millennia. Um, where, so I think that the lithium, the relatively major crust through which the high rock center erupted through is actually uh, the cause for its depletion of lithium, whereas McDermott erupted through this transitional crust, so it has higher lithium. A similar story occurs in Primavera, Sierra de Primavera in Mexico, which has very similar uh, crust to that at McDermott. You can see that it has the same chloride composition 
and yet has this lower lithium signature than the rocks at McDermott, which erupted through more felsic continental crust. And finally, if we look at Pantellari, a lava from Pantellari, Italy, which occurs between uh, Italy and Tunisia in the Strait of Sicily, this magma has the lowest lithium at the same rubidium and zirconium concentrations of these other magmas, and this is because it erupted through very thin, extending continental crust. So we can look at this another way by, if we understand that crust is really the driving factor that causes lithium enrichment. This is a plot of lithium versus zirconium, and I'm using zirconium as a proxy for the amount of continental crust involved in the formation of these magmas. And I've color-coded all the McDermott magmas the same here for ease of comparison. So McDermott, like I said, arrives through the transitional continental crust. And if we compare that to the Primavera and High Rock centers, which erupted through more mafic accreted island arc terrains, you can see that at similar whole rock compositions, they have a big drop off in lithium content. If we keep going down, this is the Pantelleria lava again. See, it has the highest zirconium and yet the lowest lithium of any magma analyzed. Now, if we compare this to Hideaway Park in Yellowstone, you can see that this is a partial melt of felsic lithosphere, so it has the highest lithium. And the Yellowstone center here, actually, it erupts through thick continental crust. However, the amount of crust involved in the formation of that magma is lower than the amount of crust at McDermott, so it roughly comes out in the end to the same amount of lithium. And you can see this arrow here showing that this lithium is increasing with decreasing zirconium. So we can use zirconium, in a sense, as an exploration tool for understanding what sort of magmas are enriched in lithium. And so this leads us to our main conclusion here is that this lithium enrichment is occurring in intercontinental bryolites that assimilate or partially melt uh, cratonic material. And if we look at this in one final way, we can see this is isotopic space, so epsilon e, dimium on the y-axis, 87, 86 strontium on the x-axis, and these are some common reservoirs and M is depleted mantle. These are Archean xenoliths, average of Archean xenoliths in the snake river plain. And this field AT is the accreted terrains underneath the high rock center. If we look at the different magmas in their isotopic space, as well as scaled once again to the lithium content, you can see that Pantelleria and Primavera, which have the lowest lithium contents, are the closest to the mantle values and accreted terrains. And as you get closer, to more radiogenic felsic crust, the lithium enrichment increases. And this is consistent with simple isotopic mixing lines between steam basalt and local Cretaceous granites near McDermott, showing that about 50% of each <coughs> are involved in the formation of this rhyolite. So you have 50% crust here that's relatively enriched in lithium. But if you compare that to Yellowstone mixing, the Yellowstone has crust that's more enriched in lithium, but only incorporates about 20% of it. And that roughly equates to about 1,400 ppm in both magnets. So once again, the highest is in Hideaway Park, so this lithium enrichment is increasing with the increasing proportion of felsic crust. So what does this mean for McDermott? So it essentially means that calderas act as like the ideal lithium deposit if you have a caldera forming continental or transitional crust is you have the eruption of this magma or ignimbrite that's enriched in lithium, and then you have a proximal basin into which leach, uh, lithium from these lithium-enriched rocks can deposit into the caldera lake. And any residual magma that's degassing or solidifying here can have vapors and fluids that rise along these caldera ring fractures and form a low-temperature hydrothermal system in the caldera lake sediments, and that can actually uh, create the conditions under which you can form lithium deposit and these hectorite clays that are rich in lithium. So, fortunately, in the western U.S., calderas are not in short supply. We can see that this is a map of Nevada from Henry et al. in 2012. You can see all these blue circles here are calderas uh, from throughout the western U.S. that occur on this thick craton. However, you need to also have the final part of the recipe for lithium deposit, preserve caldera lake sediments, because if you don't preserve them over, cent over millennia, you're not going to um, have a lithium resource. So in summary, we have several pieces of the puzzle that help us solve a bunch of different questions, including notably the ignimbrite, we have, which we saw, we used the geochemistry to help correlate different ignimbrites and understand the composition of the magmas. We use little mountain collisions trapped in these crystals to help us understand why lithium enrichment occurs where it does. We use different 
phenocrysts, so different types of feldspars, to help us understand different ages of these caldera-forming eruptions, how frequently they occur, and how frequently flood basalt uh, provinces occur. And we use this to make a slightly more complicated model to show this is a cross-section of the northern McDermott volcanic field, showing these previously identified white horse caldera and these new Pole Canyon and Fish Creek calderas in the northern part of the field. And this puzzle all came together at the end to form a nice geological map of the northern McDermott volcanic field, and I won't get into the details of that. But that map and that puzzle helped us answer these main questions. One, that the geochemistry and 4039 geochronology of McDermott ignimbrites and other tufts helped establish a regional stratigraphy and constrain the timing of flood basalts. Two, that the mapping of these caldera sources at McDermott, as well as the mapping that's been done at High Rock Caldera Complex, delineated two southward propagating dike swarms, or was previously thought to be one, and this shows that it's consistent with the plume head theory of Yellowstone. Third, that lithium enrichment occurs in the rhyolite magmas at McDermott. And finally, that intracontinental calderas exist throughout the United States. We can actually start looking in them to, uh, for additional lithium resources that can hopefully help meet the rising demand of lithium. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And I want to make sure that I acknowledge uh, all the different funding sources that Gail alluded to earlier. I was fortunate to receive a Department of Defense ND State Fellowship that funded me for three years. This year, I'm currently on the Stanford USGS Fellowship. And I received several grants from Stanford, the GSA, and USGS that helped fund all of my research in the field, and I'm grateful to that. I also wanted to thank my advisor, Gail, for all of her guidance over the past six years. She has been a rock for me, and her patience with me, especially with my writing, I'm very grateful for her. Um, I remember my first summer here in the field, I, after I came back from the field season, I collected like 200 rocks or something, and I, I didn't know what I was looking at, but, so, but I was so excited, and I went to Gail's office and expecting a short meeting, but she stuck with me for over 10 hours that day as I went through every single rock that I collected that summer, and uh, she really helped uh, keep me energized and inspired to learn about all these pieces of the puzzle that I keep alluding to. I'm especially grateful for her guidance in the field because she's really taught me the importance of field geology. It's very easy to, to stay in the lab and zap minerals to get the composition. It's really fun and exciting, but unless you know where that rock came from and how it relates to everything around it, it doesn't really mean anything without that context. So Gail has really drilled it into me, the importance of doing this, and I'm very grateful for that skill that I've obtained from field geology. She's been with me with her dogs, the dogs have been walking on the ground in my back, in my <laughs> arms. Um, and I just had a wonderful time with her out in the field, including a great book trip with her and my parents a few years ago. She also has been a wonderful field instructor to everyone in this room uh, who's a graduate student. We've all been on field trips with Gail. There's an epic photo of her pointing at, is that Lassen? Or I think it's Lassen of Shaskin, maybe. And it's just, she's taught us so much, and we all are better geologists for it. So. Thank you so much, Gil. I also want to thank Marty, who's been, uh, I, we all appreciate Marty's sense of humor and uh, Sasquatch calls. But he's great in the field and also is indispensable to me and my research and many of our research. He is a rock. He spent late nights and weekends in the lab running my samples when I wasn't there and running blanks and whatnot. So he's, thank you so much for all of your help. Matt Koble, who in the beginning of my time here, he defended my first quarter. Uh, with Gail, and since that time, he's helped guide the trajectory of my research. And in the past uh, three years, he's really become a great collaborator, really helping with the lithium project and understanding, trying to get all we can out of the data that we see. So thank you for all your help. I'd also like to thank Jim Rytuber from the USGS, who, like I said, did all the initial mapping at McDermott. And with time uh, and investing technologies, we're able to really constrain the geology that he initially sorted out. And it's been such an honor to have you by my side as we redid the geology of this field. I'm also thankful for all your expertise on the ore deposits angle of this research. To Elizabeth Miller, who's, been, uh, who's another field expert at Stanford that we all have been on field trips with and taken classes with. I've learned so much about the geology of North America and the Cordillera from her. And she's also been giving wonderful advice. Paul Siegel, who graciously served as chair for, of this committee. Thank you for doing that. 
and also for that. When I was deciding whether to go to Stanford or Caltech seven years ago, so you were, you were one of the ones who convinced me to stay here, <laughs> and thank you for that. I'd also like to give a thanks to Jonathan Stebbins uh, at Stanford and uh, several researchers at the USGS and the top panel who opened their labs to me and helped me run all my samples. And then Wes, uh, Dave, Al Hoffa, and Celeste Mercer are all at the USGS as well who provided samples for the lithium project. Um, of course, I have to thank all my field, wonderful field assistants, uh, Emily Williams, Maxine Luckett, Rachel Hampton, Ian Hagman, Jillian Mellis, Marla Witter, Jackson Borchardt, and Meredith Townsend, <coughs> Winnie and Peek, of course. Uh, they, it gets hot out there in the desert sun and you start to go kind of crazy. Uh, but we had a lot of great times in addition to learning really cool geology and um, take a lot of selfies and uh, drink a lot, maybe maybe drink a lot of beer at night. Not during the day, though. But it, I had a wonderful times out there with you all. And, and many of you could be here today. Some are listening or it looks like it went off. But uh, thank you for all your support in the field. I also want to thank the GS staff, who, uh, including Yvonne in the back, who all have been so helpful with filling out forms and paperwork, and Lord knows I had a lot of paperwork, and Sarah and Ronnie in the Dean's office, and also Lorette Creason at the GLO, who was very helpful to me at the time. I'd also like to thank my thesis advisor from undergrad, Mark, who came uh, all the way from Japan earlier this week to be here today. Uh, Mark was one of the ones who got me into geology. I was first a political science major in college, and I went on my first geology field trip with him in uh, New Hampshire and Maine, and then we went up to Canada, and I really started to get an appreciation for uh, field geology and how important it was. And from there on, he's been a great advisor up until this point, and hopefully in the future we went to Iceland together, Hawaii together, so it's great to have him for geology advice, as well as advice just about birds, but not advice about birds, but knowledge about birds. <laughs> And a whole host of issues, so I'm thankful for all of your support over the years. Now, there's way too many graduate students to thank, but as you fellow students in the geology department know, it can be a very isolating experience working for hours on end just by yourself, your computer in the lab, so to have those off times where you can just have fun and goof off with you all, it's just been a wonderful experience to become such great friends with you all. And I thank you for all your support and help over the years. We've had a lot of great times, goofy times, and <laughs> hope they continue in the future. So I want to thank my non-GS friends that uh, have been that I've made since I've been at Stanford. You guys have also been there for me throughout through thick and thin, and we've just had a lot of great times over the years. And I'm thankful for all that you've done and all the memories that we've made. Also, my college friends. There were too many friends to thank so all the pictures and many slides, but you guys have been there from the time I was a poli-sci major till now, and we visited each other, and I hope this visits continue, and we have a lot of great times in the future. Um, next, I'll uh, invite keep together. Uh, I've had, um, it's been a great experience, but it's been plagued by like, car accidents and uh, a lot of car troubles, I know we turned them into a good time. Um, my mom being diagnosed with cancer a second time. Uh, crazy jaw surgery and the passing of my grandmother. Um, so, um, I just want to thank my family for always being there. And, oh, God. <laughs> we do a lot together. We're a close family. We do crazy runs. We're running from Miami to Key West. and. Many of us at the Boston Marathon, paddling in San Diego, um, and you guys have always been there for me, and you all came out here, including my grandmother, Momor, who, um, for the first time west of the Mississippi, came out here for this, so um, she's been, she's the most inquisitive person I know. If you have any questions, you'll find the, a YouTube video that answers it. <laughs> she's the best researcher I know, and I'm, I hope, I think I've got some of my research skills from her, so thank you. Now my sisters, um, from the time I was little, they were both older than me, uh, we played school, and there was always two teachers and I was one student. <laughs> <laughs> so they instilled in me the importance of a good education from the get-go. And I'm, I'm so following their footsteps. They both just got their PhDs in the past few months. And so, 
Thank you for that. My sister Karen, who's my running buddy each race I've done in the past few years, she's been there. And she is, I like to call her the base player I know, um, with her cryptographic accelerators and whatnot. I don't understand a bit of it, but <laughs> she's an inspiration for me, just like my other nerdy sister, who's also an inspiration, chocolate lover, and she is the most detail-oriented person I know and really has kept me like on my game with understanding every aspect of every problem. And she brought Stacy into her life, who is I love more, as much as I do my other sisters, and she's the kindest person I know. So I'm so grateful to have three amazing sisters to be with me. And then um, my parents, who they've been through a lot um, the past several years, um, but they've all, no matter what, they always find time to talk to me and be there for me. They come up to the field with me several times, and they're just like uh, inspirational, doesn't even like begin to cover it. My mom, who just beat cancer a second time. <laughs> Giving me all the science background that I need, and she's also some of the toughest, most tenacious person I know who still knows how to goof around. And um, I'm prepared for her. And my last but not least, my dad, who is also is the king of puns. I think I get my <laughs> my jokes from a combination of them. But he has been he's the biggest goofball I know, but he's also the most selfless person on the planet. He will. Go. Even like when his mother passed away a few months ago, he kept the whole family together, and um, he's just is there for everyone, no matter what, no matter what you want. So, with that, and sorry, I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> What is the next step now? So now that you have all of this research, how are you going to use it in the next step of your journey? Yeah, so I don't know what the next step of my journey is yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if anyone's hiring, let's say. Uh, uh, the, there are several places where I can go. I think in the northern part in the Lake Hawaii volcanic field, in terms of field work, there's a lot of unpublished un mapping that needs to be done to help constrain that northern Chief Joseph Dice Warp to understand uh, what is the progression of volcanism in that area and the timing in relation to the flood basalts. I think also from a lithium resource standpoint, I think we've started to narrow down what causes lithium enrichment, but we want to look at other systems throughout the world to understand that. Also, we're able to measure several elements using this technique, including copper, which needs to be homogenized like lithium, if you remember that plot. So we can actually start to use this to understand what causes copper enrichment. We use coppers in all the wires in this building and throughout the world. So these are important, uh, some important research questions that can be done. Yeah, sure. Um, that was awesome, Tom. Um, in a couple of the calderas, I think it was yep, the Yellowstone system mostly, the melt inclusions showed still a pretty wide variation in lithium, but kind of stable uh, zirconium, I guess it was. Do you think there's another parameter that could be affecting it, like volatile content or um, something else that you just haven't been able to explore yet? Yeah, so I think the range that we're seeing in lithium is uh, dominantly uh, two functions. One is uh, fractional crystallization, so the more evolved things will have higher lithium because it's an incompatible element. So we can see a pretty big range in lithium. Uh, some of these magmas have been sitting there, so you're tra sequentially trapping later and later and later portions of the magma chamber before it erupts. So you, I think most of the range that we see is that, but it's also a function of the amount of degassing. So degassing just doesn't occur as it erupts. Um, degassing is occurring throughout the whole time. Some people think the gassing may actually trigger these super eruptions. So each inclusion may be recording a different part of that degassing history. So as soon as you degas that lithium, it's going to go away. So the range we see in lithium could partially also be a function of that. So, so um, in, just, in connection to what you just said, um, what is the lithium concentration in the deposits and compared to your multi-inclusion concentration? And what sort of inference can you make about like what was vented during the production? Right. So I don't have the plot. Right, with, by the way. 
Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the pot right here, but it, it most NAGMAs degas around 60% of the lithium. If you compare the degas matrix class to the mountain inclusion, about 60 to 70% of lithium has been lost during that just that process alone. Uh, and relating to the first part of your question, the amount of the deposit, it's about 0.1% lithium uh, of, of a whole rock. So it's it's actually rough, nearly equivalent to what we're seeing, but that's lithium, not uh, uh, no, that's that's right. Yeah, so it's roughly equivalent. So it's not very enriched in lithium, but it's just compared to anything else, it's the uh, it's the most rich thing. Yeah. This is a super minor point. Why is the the calcium concentration important for the argon? Because potassium uh, forty decays to argon forty. So the more potassium you have, the more argon you have. You're able to see it better in the uh, machine. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, I'm a German with the history that like six hundred history of ultras. How significant do you think that plays um, into kind of the concentration of lithium in that region? Like, would you expect that uh, because there's that kind of like cumulative progression at that site, it, it has such a that's why it has a larger deposit and then. You know, there's so many other calderas, but they might not be as right. concentrated. So this, that's a good question. This map, this caldera here is very simplified compared to what it actually is. Um, Jim is, is the expert on this part of the field. This is several collapse events that all occurs roughly in quick succession, relatively in quick succession. So I think that by having multiple events over several tens of thousands of years maybe, or less than that, uh, you can probably call, you have a lot of activity going on. So I think that you have a lot of fluids going or moving around and eruptions. So you have a lot of maybe even just smaller volume airfall material, this ashy lithium rich material that's more so sitting around here than maybe other places. And so by having a higher surface area with more lithium, you might be able to whatever groundwater or hydrothermal fluids are circulating and moving this lithium around and depositing in the basin, perhaps that plays an additional role where you don't get that at other centers. Just a comment, um, that was a fantastic talk. Um, did sort of a lot of work. Um, on the, just the tectonic comment on the uh, causing the pattern of the dikes and from a structure standpoint that actually looks like, oh, it's like a swash X. It actually looks like shear band kind of pattern. And so instead of having a sort of like radiant plume, it's not going to have something to do with the stress and the sphere as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I'm a little confused on one point. You, you took uh, lithium from quartz inclusions in which? In so. Uh, or um, my, my, the end of my question is, how did the preserved lake sediments have importance? So that's a good question. So we're measuring the magma pre-eruptive concentration. And so when the magma erupts, you have, say, like we talked about before, maybe 60% lower values of that in the tuff. So most degassed magmas or, or rhyolite glasses are around this in the western U.S., but McDermott's are probably slight, slightly higher. So that gas matrix is still higher, uh, but that material is sitting around in the vicinity of the caldera and in that intracaldera ignimbrite below the caldera lake sediment. So as rainwater comes around, groundwater, hydrothermal fluids all leach into this below point in the ground, it's like the watershed for the for this caldera, it all leaches that lithium that's relatively enriched and deposits it in the caldera lake sediments. So by themselves, it's not enriched enough in the rock, but once it gets all together in the caldera lakes and then it can become there. So the is in the rocks too, as a proxy for the yes. okay. Yes. Oh, oh. So I'm just thinking in terms of sort of barriers here. So you talked about the lithium concentration in the mountains well preserved. Um, but you also mentioned in your talk how U.S. imports all of it were. So, what do you think are sort of some of the barriers as far as the United States and sort of exploiting some of these great resources that we have in Northern Nevada? What sort of needs to be done? 
I guess on the geology standpoint, but also maybe from a, from a broader policy context. Well, it helps to have governments that support science and science research. <laughs> uh, but also, as the demand for lithium is rising, um, the USGS is developing, uh, has a critical mineral strategy, and Catherine, Jim are, are part, part of that, uh, where they're starting to look into resources like this. Because when we did, came out to California for the gold rush, we were looking for gold, and then economic geology was focusing on these traditional ore minerals. So we know every, we don't know everything, but we know a lot about gold, silver, molybdenum, copper, where those deposits form, why they form, where they do. But only recently with rare earths, these, those, I forget, it's like 20 pounds of neodymium is used in every single wind turbine or something like that. Lithium, tellurium, gallium, all these resources that we don't know how they're formed, what the genesis is. So there's really this push now to understand the fundamental science behind these resources to really understand where we can explore for them to potentially help gain domestic sources of them and uh, perform that research. Great. So I think maybe at this point we'll bring the speaker again and then close the public session of this. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.